Carolina ran. Right over there. He ran away. What's up guys, welcome to another episode. So I'm out here doing a little backyard birding today and figured wildlife is on my brain. Wildlife is kind of always on my brain. Uh, but apparently wildlife is on you guys' brain too because one of the most common questions that I get concerning wildlife, I get this question regarding all types of photography and videography, but I get it a lot in the wildlife section, like all my wildlife videos and everything. What camera gear should I buy to get into wildlife photography? That question I see more than anything. Instagram DMs, YouTube comments, emails, all of that stuff. That is one of the most common questions that I get. So today I'm gonna do a little Q and A or you've already done the Q. I'm gonna do the answering part and I'm gonna talk about it. So basically I just wanna to talk to you guys and get some of this out and put it in there. And hopefully that will help you guys understand or get a better ballpark of the ideas of the directions that you can go with wildlife photography. So with that being said, let's talk about a few things that are going to be important to your decision-making factors. Those are gonna be your skills, like what level are you at? You're not, if you're a beginner, you're not gonna be jumping into a 1DX Mark II and a 600 F4, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so your skill level, your budget, super important. How much money are you willing to spend? Your weight tolerance, and by that I mean how much are you, how much gear, how much weight are you willing to carry around for wildlife photography. Those are the three big things to me that I look at when I recommend something or when I'm looking at buying something myself. Do you see that woodpecker right there? I think that was like either a red-bellied or a red-naped woodpecker. So anyways, what are we talking about? DSLRs, mirrorless, this is when the possibilities start opening up. This is when you start having a lot more options and a lot more things to consider. From my experiences, I would definitely say if you're looking into getting into wildlife photography uh, with a decent budget, but not like break the bank, we're gonna start lower here. I would start looking at bodies that are like the Canon 7D Mark II, or a 90D or an 80D. Uh, I did use a 70D, a Canon 70D for quite a long time and it, it actually does pretty good. So I wouldn't, I would say 70D, 80D, 90D is the newest one, the 7D Mark II. All of those cameras are extremely great value for wildlife. Also, before we go any further, you might notice that I have an inclination or a proclivity to talk about Canon cameras. That is not because I'm a Canon fanboy. I, that is because I use Canon and that's what I have. And that's what I have the most experience in. So I have not, I used to shoot on Nikon a long time ago, but I have not shot on Nikon in a long time. And I have never shot on Sony. So from a personal standpoint, you're asking me personally, what I use and what I recommend, I'm always going to start with Canon, but that will in no way deter me from saying uh, a Nikon or a Sony uh, equivalent couldn't do the job because in fact, there are a number of great Nikon cameras. You don't have to just get Canon. You know, that's just what I'm gonna be talking about because it's what I have and it's what I know. All right, so those are kind of some of the bodies that I would recommend taking a look at. Now let's talk about lenses and again, I think lenses are definitely the most important factor here. Uh, if you get any of those bodies that I've recommended, even if you got a lower end body like a Canon T7i or a Nikon D5300 or 5500 or something, uh, you can really, really still pull off some good stuff if you focus on getting good glass. So again, starting out on the Canon side, a couple of lenses jump out at me right away and these are the lenses that i went for first when i started out in wildlife photography and they are the canon 300 millimeter uh, prime f4 l lens and it has image stabilization and the canon 400 millimeter f5.6 
L lens, but it does not have image stabilization. So the first great thing about both of these lenses is they are prime lenses. They are L series, which is Canon's highest level. They have the, the red ring here. Any Canon lens you see with a red ring is their L series. And that basically means it's the best that they put out in terms of image quality and uh, weather sealing and all that stuff. So both of those are L-series lenses. They're made very well. Uh, they're rugged, they can handle all kinds of stuff. And they're being prime lenses is the important thing here. So they can't zoom. This is a 300 and a 400. And there's ups and downs to that. The, the pros to the prime lenses are they're super light and they're super sharp. So, and by sharp, I mean extremely good image quality. And the last pro is uh, they're pretty affordable. Both of them are, you can find for under $1,000. So I've had both of those lenses and I've used them both for years. Uh, I actually didn't use the 400 that long and I sold it and then chose to keep the 300 F4 IS. And I did that for two reasons, image stabilization and minimal focusing distance. So the 300 can focus much closer, like under a meter or just right around a meter it can focus. That means you can be around a meter away from your subject to focus on it. So that's really handy and that makes the 300 super versatile. It makes it great for macro stuff, uh, butterflies, you know, portraits, all kinds. It's, it's a fantastic lens. I use it for a lot more than wildlife. But the image stabilization is why I kept the 300 for so long. I kept it for years and years and years and it was an incredible lens. And I actually, I kind of wish that I didn't have to sell it. I wish that I could have still kept it because I would have still used it. Uh, but I needed the money to help get this instead. And that's what I did. But when this came out, there were not a lot of third party options. And that's where things are getting interesting now because now there are options from companies like Tamron and Sigma who both offer lenses in the 150 to 600 millimeter range. And that is an incredibly good wildlife range. So those would be the next two things that I would recommend taking a look at. And the great thing about those third party lenses is that they work for all the systems. So whether you're Canon or Nikon or Sony, now how well they work with everything, I don't know. I've only used them on Canon, but the times that I've tried out the Sigma 150 to 600, this is a contemporary version, not even the sports version. So there's two versions of that. The contemporary is cheaper and lighter. The sports version is more weather sealed, more expensive and heavier. Uh, but I did try the contemporary and then the Tamron 150 to 600 G2. Both of those are really great lenses and they are relatively affordable. But the beauty of those lenses is they're zoom lenses. So the beauty of a zoom lens is that when you're trying to focus on wildlife, if you haven't been doing it for very long, uh, trying to find your target at 300 or 400 or 500 or 600 millimeters is quite difficult. So having the ability to zoom out and then get a wider field of view, find your target animal and then zoom in on it, that's a lot easier than trying to pick it out from 400 millimeters straight. Like that's just, it's that's something, that's a skill that you acquire. So having those zooms is very nice for that. Not to mention if the animals come closer, if they're bigger animals, or if you wanna step out and do uh, landscapes or portraits or anything else like that, having the zooms then becomes uh, much, much better. The downside to the zoom lenses are the aperture. So they, they are not a constant aperture, most of them. If, if they are, they're very expensive. One last thing that I wanna mention uh, real quick is the difference between APS-C crop bodies and full frame cameras. So a lot of wildlife photographers, even if they're professional, they still prefer to have a crop body camera. And what that means is the sensor is smaller than a full frame sensor. So that means that there is a crop to the focal length. And on Canon, that crop is 1.6. On Nikon, it's 1.5. That means that you have to multiply 1.5 times your focal length. And that's the real focal length. So if I put this 400 onto a crop body like the 70 Mark II, the 70D, the 80D, the 90D, any Rebel camera, anything that's not a 5D or a 1D series, then I am getting that magnification, which is effectively making my 400 millimeter a 640 millimeter. That is attractive to a lot of wildlife photographers because that's an extra 240 millimeters in this case that I'm getting out of that. And that's a big deal in terms of reach. 
The downside to crop bodies, of course, is a smaller sensor size. So that means that translates to, uh, in layman's term, less light and not as good of high ISO capabilities as the full frame cameras. So if you know that you're not going to be shooting in crappy situations or dark situations or anything like that, and you've got good light and all of that, then shooting on a crop body with any lens is going to give you more reach. And if you're just starting out, that might be a very attractive option for you. So to recap, without knowing you or your situation or your skills or your budget or your motivations or anything like that, some of the things that I recommend that are good intro to uh, wildlife photography kits would be the 7D Mark II. I think the Canon 7D Mark II, I think, is the best bang for your buck wildlife camera ever created. It does have its problems. There are things better and there are things worse. However, it was designed for sports and wildlife, and for that, it does a great job. 90D, 80D, 70D. Those are my top four recommendations in that order for intro to wildlife in the Canon world. Lenses in the Canon world that I recommend. Number one lens would probably be a tie between the Sigma 150 to 600 Contemporary and the Tamron 150 to 600 G2. I think maybe the Tamron G2 edges it out a little bit in quality, uh, but that's debatable. They're both still really great. The 300, the Canon 300 F4 L series with image stabilization, that is an amazing lens. It's a prime lens. We've already talked about the pros and cons of that. Uh, and then the Canon 400, if you want a little more reach and it's still a prime, super sharp, no image stabilization. So that's gonna take a lot of getting used to uh, if you're hand holding and shooting around, which you will be for wildlife. And then I would definitely recommend this lens only if you can afford it and do not push your budget because this is a serious lens. This is the 100 to 400 Mark II. It is the best lens I've ever had. It's my favorite lens I've ever had and not just for wildlife. I use this lens for more than anything. I use it for landscapes, for portraits, for wildlife, for all kinds of stuff. This is my absolute favorite lens, but it is not a beginner lens. It is big, it is heavy, it is expensive. But if you can afford it, you will live with this lens forever. So that's on my very last bottom of the list here. In the Nikon world, the D7000, I believe that's it. Uh, that one's also a very good wildlife intro to wildlife camera that's very similar to, I believe, the, uh, the Canon 70D and 80D series. And I would even go down to as far as the D5500 Possibly that's definitely one of the most entry-level Nikons there are, but Nikon tends to do entry-level cameras better, I think, than Canon in terms of autofocus and ISO capability, dynamic range, that sort of thing. And then for lenses, the same thing. My top two are still going to be the Sigma and the Tamron, both for the Nikon mount or the Nikon 300 f4, which is going to be more expensive, but that's a super light, compact, very sharp lens. And then the 200 to 500 Nikon, that lens is pretty great, although it's a lot bigger and heavier and all of that stuff. And the price tag is more expensive, but that's a great lens to look at if you can afford it again. So those are my top recommendations for wildlife gear for intro to wildlife photography. I hope that helps you guys out. I know I talk a lot, so if you're still here, I really appreciate that. If you guys have any questions about any of the stuff that I went over or didn't go over, leave those in the comments below and I'll definitely answer them. If you have any tips or gear recommendations that you've used that you think are great, leave those in the comments below for everybody else so that we can all benefit from that. I do also have a few other videos on wildlife photography, uh, which are just more about wildlife photography in general and how to get better wildlife photography images. So those are definitely worth checking out if you haven't already seen those. And definitely make sure you subscribe to my channel. I've got new videos every week. Hit that like button if this video helped you out. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one. I'm gonna go shoot that really noisy bird in the face now. Cause he is right above me. That's a cardinal by the way. Very noisy cardinal. So while I've been talking today, I've got 
a woodpecker, a Carolina wren, a cardinal, chickadee, and those are pretty much the highlights. There he is. I'll move over. 